Embrace 
okay, what a way to open up the night. <laughs> well, we've been talking about some pretty deep stuff, but I don't think we've really taken our deep dive yet this week, so I thought tonight we would do that. <laughs> we've been kind of in the preschool phase, but you know, talking about our emotions and our grievances and all the stuff coming up, fears, doubts, financial fears, health issues, you know, in the context of our metaphysics and everything, but but actually I'd, tonight I'd like to go much, much, much deeper than we've gone because really the goal is to wake up to heaven and to oneness and so we have to really start to uh, really start to just look at the what is asked of me and and we're basically hearing from Jesus he said well to forgive you have to learn to overlook the error that you can become so tuned in with the Holy Spirit so aligned with spirit that you literally can't perceive error anymore and how is that possible well to humans it's not but to the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit Jesus says, looks beyond the defiled altar to the light of the atonement. So the Holy Spirit is directly in contact with the light. Being the light and being directly in contact with the light, the Spirit is able to overlook the error entirely. And that's why the Course says, you forgive your brother, you forgive your sister for what they have not done. You know, it's a misperception that we're dealing with. It's a trick. We've been tricked. Tricked into feel, feeling guilty. We've been tricked into feeling fearful. And God didn't create us to be guilty or fearful, but the ego is a trick. And we have to kind of expose the trick. There's a part in the workbook of A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, these are the exact words from Jesus from the workbook, time is a trick, a sleight of hand. You know, like magicians, time is a trick, a sleight of hand. And then there's another one, this, this sentence always gets me, it's just, just the most amazing, amazing sentence. I wish you know, here I am in Europe, I wish I could have an extra seat and tonight I could, you know, how we invite different ones, I wish I could invite Albert Einstein to come and join us tonight. Because I think Albert would have had really a lot of fun with the Course. Because actually Jesus says some really deep things that it seems like Albert discovered about this world and Jesus knows them too, so their, their minds are really connected. Uh, he was, Albert Einstein was saying that the, the human condition was like a, a de delusional trick, a, a de delusional trick of consciousness. And, and so that's basically what Jesus is saying in the Course. It's a trick. Consciousness is a trick. And if you come to think of it, if eternity has no beginning and no end. It's just changeless. It's just forever. It's just bliss. It's just oneness, nirvana, heaven, or whatever. If we look at the world as a human being through the ego's perception, what do we perceive in this world? We perceive change, right? We perceive change. It's like we're looking through a kaleidoscope and there's a lot of colors and lots of things spinning in there. So we have this intuitive feeling that where we come from is eternal, but we don't know what that is anymore because we've had so much amnesia. We've completely forgotten eternity. And now all we seem to face every day, every night, when we're dreaming, daytime dreams, nighttime dreams, it doesn't matter, we're dealing with change. And basically to an eternal being, change is stressful. Talk about being out of your element. Imagine if you just exist in perfect love as an eternal being and all of a sudden, through some kind of trick, you find yourself 
in an environment of, of change. Lots of it. The scientists are even telling us that, that the cosmos, you know, they talked about the Big Bang and the cosmos, but the cosmos is expanding. The cosmos is not a static thing. The cosmos is expanding. Um, and here's the line from Jesus. I wish Einstein was here because I'd love to hear what he had to say about this. He probably would be fascinated. Or maybe we could have Einstein. You know, you, Europe is famous for a lot of things. I'd have Einstein here and Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> right? Because you know why we, we like to watch Sherlock Holmes because he gets, he solves things. And Einstein, what? He's, he loved to solve things. He came up with stuff so far beyond the mind of the scientists of this realm that they're like, they're still amazed at some of the stuff. Einstein, Sherlock. Well, let's, maybe we need a philosopher here. You've got a lot of famous philosophers over here. Who are we going to pick? There's the ancient Greeks. Now let's pick somebody from Germany. Let's have Immanuel Kant. Uh, Immanuel Kant and Sherlock Holmes and Einstein here. Oh, I love my company tonight because we're going to blow your minds tonight. And we'll blow their minds too, but they're going to enjoy this too. Because Immanuel Kant, he was, as far as I know, he was the first philosopher that asked this question. And I think when I first read this, I was like, well, that is really cool. I mean, I like philosophers because they have really deep questions. But Kant, from Germany, I think he was from Heidelberg, he says, how do we know what we know? I was like, that's a good question. How do we know what we know? The Buddhist would probably say, well, as long as you're perceiving a world, you don't know anything. And Jesus would agree <laughs> with the Buddhist. But what about how do we know what we know? And Jesus says knowing is like knowledge, capital K, is heaven. So Immanuel Kant postulated some ideas, but one of his ideas was, he said, I think we know everything before we are born. Isn't that it? The same guy that comes up with the question, how do we know what we know, says, what if we know everything? He called it a priori, prior to the five senses. What if we already know everything before we're born? Sounds a little bit like Jesus. Before Abraham was, I am. Same kind of thing. What if, what if eternity is prior to time and we're just stuck in some kind of Groundhog Day loop uh, repeating the past every moment of every day and thinking we're living in the loop but we're not at all inside the loop at all and never have been. Wouldn't that be great if tonight we could just discover this together and like Phil and the Groundhog Day get out of the loop? Like Truman and the Truman Show, we could find the exit door tonight, all of us and our guests. They're pretty fascinated about tonight too. I'm excited. Jesus, what Jesus says, Jesus says, here's the one, now just ponder on this from Jesus. History would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. I'll say it again, because when I first heard this from Jesus, I'm just like, oh. History would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. And also, you see, he's working with us in his course. He's, he's really begging us, he's calling us to... to Except the, he calls it the holy instant. He's drawing us, drawing us into the holy instant. Please come into the holy instant. Come into the light. And he even says things like, um, here's another beautiful one. You can't prepare for the holy instant without placing it in the future. Whoa. First he's telling us that history wouldn't even exist if you didn't, keep making the same mistake in the present. And now he's saying, I'm inviting you to the holy instant, but 
If you prepare for it, you'll place it in the future and it's not there. So now he's telling us, we need no preparation. Uh, how do we get there then, if we don't prepare for it? We're, all, we're used to time and preparing. You prepare for your, your exams. You prepare your, your dinner. <laughs> you prepare your house. You, sometimes you go to school and you prepare your life <laughs> with your academic pursuits. And now he's saying, you can reach the holy instant. He said, he said, you can reach the holy instant by desiring it. So we're back to that prayer again. That's how we bring it into awareness. We go into the present moment by our desire. Remember the Wizard of Oz? Dorothy, you always had the power to go home. You just, you, you always had the power. We've always had the power. So, before we watch the movie tonight, you know, this movie is, is in my Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, and, and actually here, it was, it was Francis and, and Svava, Kirsten, they're like, show this movie, show it, show it, show it, show it. Because they see I get all kinds of excited with, I call them quantum movies. We got a little bit about, the, in the first movie, you know, there was the big Y2K thing, the flash, and then it was almost like a, a parallel universe without the Beatles that was in there. Well, this is definitely a quantum movie, and when I say quantum, I have to say again that quantum physics is a branch of science, but what was discovered in quantum theory and quantum physics and quantum science completely transcended all of our old ideas about science. So, you know, a lot of us, depending on how old you are, a lot of us grew up and we took some science classes. It was like we were in the prehistoric, we were in the dinosaur age compared to quantum physics. It's really good stuff and oh, it fits so beautifully with A Course in Miracles. Jesus is telling us the same thing, the quantum physicist, Einstein, ooh, this is getting good. We're getting close to the escape hatch because we're starting to realize what quantum physics discovered is there is, there is no external world. There is no world apart from your consciousness. And they did a bunch of experiments, but uh, you know, they did this thing called the double slit experiment where they were firing these, these uh, atomic particles through these little slits uh, in, a, in metal and they thought they knew what would happen when they fired these particles but it was the most confusing thing because whatever was going on on the other side of that metal plate was not at all what they expected and they kept trying different things and they, start, they finally realized that how do these particles turn into waves? These are particles of light and particles of matter, but how do particles turn into waves just by passing through a, a piece of metal? They, couldn't, they just couldn't figure it out until they put a little camera there and they found that just the very act of putting a camera there and just by observing the tiniest, these tiniest particles, it changed things. Just through observing them. Ooh, tough one. They have to let go of all of Newtonian physics, the belief that there is a, that things are things, that, that matter is, you know, it's somehow a part, and it can be studied. And now the observation of, of the phenomena changes the phenomena. You're going to hear that tonight in the movie. Every time you look at, at this world through the lens of time, it changes. It's a trick. And we have to come to the bottom of this. We have to really forgive and go with Jesus into this point that transcends this, this trick. That was called the observer effect. Just by observing something, you can change it. That was very disturbing.
for scientists. And then there's another thing in quantum physics, it's called entanglement, where you can have a particle in time and space and another particle that is way, way far away. We're talking hundreds of thousands of miles, millions of miles away, and they found that if you if you do something to one particle, it can affect another particle that's not even close to it at all. And even Einstein was a little bit, woo. He, he called this phenomenon spooky action at a distance. <laughs> spooky. <laughs> all right, Albert, we heard that, spooky. He gave it the name spooky. Sounds like something out of Halloween. Scientists don't like things that they can't explain because if you can touch one particle and it influences another particle so far away, what's going on? They don't know how to explain that. They call it entanglement. We, we would call it also the quantum field. Everything is connected. Everything in the whole cosmos is completely connected. But in terms of Newtonian physics, that makes no sense at all. There's another phenomenon in quantum physics that we're going to see a little bit of in the movie tonight, but this is going to be acted out. Nicolas Cage is going to be our main actor tonight, but they're going to act it out. But there's, a, there's one called superposition, and basically that it's the discovery in, in quantum physics that that molecules aren't really things, and electrons aren't really things, and protons aren't really things, but everything is, we'll call it, in the realm of potential. And then when you believe something about it, or you think something about it, it takes shape, it comes, it seems to come into being just by your thought. So, Super potential. Some of you might have seen that movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, where the, li the little black child is dribbling the ball and then all of a sudden there's basketballs all over the place. And basically it's that the basketballs are, could be in any position, but it's just, it's what you decide that locks it down in a particular position. So as human beings, we're used to thinking like, okay, here we've got a big barn, and this is a room, and we leave the room, and we come back to the room. And when we leave the room and we go off to the castle, or we go off to another part of the area, we're not thinking, oh, that, bar, that barn's gone. I'm not thinking about it, so it's gone. You know, we're pretty sure when we come back, the barn's going to be here. We expect a barn. We expect a stage. And because we've come here on a retreat, we expect somebody to do something on this stage. <laughs> We're not just going to sit here and look at a stage for two hours. We have a lot of expectation, but what quantum physics is saying is you're just perceiving what you're believing. You're perceiving what you believe. And, and Jesus is saying, yeah, and if you change your mind from your egoic belief system to forgiveness, you're going to perceive the world very, very differently than the way you're looking right now. Some of you might remember in the Bible, there's a, be there's a beautiful saying about uh, you're looking through a darkened glass. That's what the ego is. It's a darkened glass. You know, it's in our mind, it's a darkened glass, and we're perceiving a, a very distorted, fragmented world, but we're perceiving exactly what we believe. So that's why I tell people, be careful what you pray for, because you will get it, whatever you pray for. Your prayer is your desire, and until you clear out that mind and that subconscious, you're going to get exactly what you believe. Everything that you perceive in this world is what you believe. This world is a motion picture of your belief system. Wouldn't it have been nice to know this when we were like in grade school? And then if the rest of, of grade school and the rest of high school and college was to help us clear out 
our distorted consciousness so we could be happy? Not happy because we get a job, or not happy because we have children, or not happy because it's a sunny day, but I mean like happy. There's another person I'll add to this European group here. There was an American president who freed the slaves. His name was Abraham Lincoln, and he said, a man is as happy as he makes his mind up to be. Oh my gosh, such wisdom from a president. Whew. Now that's spooky. That's spooky action at a distance. But that Jesus is saying the same thing. You're, you're actually as happy as you decide in your mind. You can actually choose to be happy, but you have to let go of grievances, judgments, distortions, false beliefs. You have to let go of the ego to be happy. Doesn't that make sense? If the ego is a death wish, and you, you decide, let go of that ego. You, you let go of that ego, and then all of a sudden you're supremely happy. It probably wouldn't surprise any of us, because we're studying A Course in Miracles, and we, we say that's the goal, <laughs> to forgive the ego, you know, to, to transcend the ego, and to return to heaven. So, basically the movie tonight, I'll give you a, just a little bit of setup for it, but I might pause it because there's so many juicy parts. But the main gist of it is our main character is a man named Chris Johnson, and he has a stage name because he's a magician. He works as a magician in Las Vegas, and Chris Johnson has a stage name, Frank Cadillac. <laughs> He likes the, name, the sound of it. So, and, but he's got this psychic ability, and I'm sure uh, you, you're going to have fun relating to this guy because is he psychokinesis? Can he move objects? No. Uh, is he a mind reader? Mm. In relation to time, a bit, because he has the ability to see things in his mind two minutes before they happen. Can imagine how that would change your life <laughs> if you had this psychic ability. You're going to meet somebody, going to have dinner, hmm, how's it looking? Hmm, ooh. <laughs> Sorry, I can't make it. <laughs> Something's come up. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> or you you see something else and oh, I'll be there as soon as possible. You know, because if you could see the future, that would be a very interesting psychic ability. And Jesus is going to use tonight that psychic ability he has to help us release some of the issues that we're dealing with. Because I will assure you, you don't really have relationship issues, you don't really have financial issues, you don't really have health issues, you don't really have issues with the environment, or you don't have issues with politicians, you don't have any genetic issues, no DNA issues, and really no issues that you think you have. I'm never upset for the reason I think. The issue is a time issue. If you believe in linear time, which the ego invented, it's going to be really tricky because it's a big trick. It's constantly trying to fool you and project causes out into time, which it made up. And it made up the body, so it's got this whole menagerie of illusions going, and it's convinced the sleeping mind that its problems are all these other things, when really it's just the belief in time is the problem. Again, Jesus says, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. Remember Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? He keeps looping, looping. He's very depressed. He tries to kill himself. He tries to do everything to get out of that loop. It's very dark and very depressing. Dark City, I mentioned, same thing. It's a closed system. Linear time is, is like a loop that's very depressing because it's so unnatural to heaven. And the only, Jesus says, you'll never be content and never be happy, except in the environment in which you were created, which is heaven. 
And intuitively, we, we know this makes sense. You know, that's why we're doing all this forgiveness work. We want to go home, just like Dorothy, just like E.T. We want to, we want to do more than phone home. <laughs> we, we want to go home. So, in this movie, Chris is, has this ability, and he feels pretty tortured by this ability, actually. He sees it pretty much as like a curse. Uh, it's hard to be spontaneous when you can see two, two minutes into the future. It's hard to have spontaneity. You know, you know what's coming, always. And, and it's a pretty much of a curse for him. And yet, he's going to have this feeling, he starts to get these intuitions, like an intuition or a guidance that he's going to meet someone and that somehow when he meets her, there's something there, there's some kind of, something's supposed to happen, there's supposed to be some kind of assignment, there's supposed to be something important happening. And he, he feels he's supposed to meet her, and he's supposed to meet her in this diner in Las Vegas, but he doesn't know when, so he just goes to the diner every day at the time that he knows he's supposed to meet her. And every day he's waiting for her to come through the door because there's something important about it. And I think for all of us, we can relate to that too. You know, how Jesus says, when you meet anyone, remember it's a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. And then he says, never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. So we know that there's certain, I mean even in the movie last night, when, when Elton and Bernie met <laughs> through those lyrics, you could tell something, there was something significant when Elton and Bernie met. When they sat there and were singing the cowboy song, you know, and, and they started to connect for the first time. That was important in both of their lives. Hugely important. And in this movie, there's something very, very, very important about Chris Johnson meeting this woman. Her name is Liz. And the, they will have a purpose for coming together, which we will discover. Uh, they will have a, a collaboration coming together, and that's another key. The collaborations are very much a key for us as miracle workers and in this movie for, for Chris and for Liz. And then, also, I, I think, I've seen a lot of movies. I mean, I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of movies, but this movie actually is such a quantum movie that it can actually teach us something about hypotheticals. Now, if you can just begin to understand hypotheticals, you're going to advance towards spiritual awakening in a huge way. So, if I said to you right now, uh, what does that mean to you? What, what does hypothetical mean to you? What would you say? Potential, okay. Hypothetical is a potential. Pot potential versus an actual. Like if somebody said, here's something, uh, if they put like an orange in your hand, and they said, I'd like to give you an orange, and, you, and they put it in your hand, you, you could go, okay. But if they stood there and they say, potentially I'd like to give you an orange, <laughs> or hypothetically, let's say hypothetically speaking, I'm going to give you an orange, you would say, okay. <laughs> When? <laughs> you, know, you might say or something. Because it's, it's, it's a potential, it's not an actual. Okay, now let's relate this to A Course in Miracles now. Let's, how does that hypothetical relate to A Course in Miracles? Well, at one point in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, he says that the mind is described in this course 
as if it has two parts, and he puts as if in italics. When Jesus starts italicizing words, you know, you know, you better pay attention. He must be, it's not underlining, but he's italicizing. So the mind is described as if it has two parts. Now why would he put as if unless he was implying maybe not really. <laughs> the mind is really one. But it's described as if it has two parts for some reason. He's not, you know, he's put it in there in that way. But even more fascinating is when you start to read about the atonement. Remember I said the atonement's our only function, our only responsibility is to accept the atonement for ourselves. He says that the atonement is the awareness that the separation never happened. What? So you mean that's what I'm going for? I'm going for an experience that the separation never happened. He's like, that's right. That's right. That's, if the world's an illusion, then, and time's an illusion, then what do you expect, you know? It, the, the atonement would be the, the experience, oh my gosh, you're back in innocence, you're back in unity, unity awareness. It's, the atonement is the awareness that the separation never happened. So it must be that A Course in Miracles is then written for a mind that believes that it did, right? Why would, why would we even need a book? The separation never happened. There, there are no books. We don't even need one, much less need one. But, and this reminds me of like Helen Shuckman and Bill Thedford, you know, they were the ones taking down the course and they were like taking it down, you know, Bill's comforting her and she's doing the shorthand dictations from Jesus and everything and they, they had actually taken down a number of chapters and then Helen and Bill, after a number of chapters, they're through a number of chapters, they say to Jesus, Jesus, just hold on a minute here, we stop just a minute, could we just maybe ask this one tiny little question here before we go on to this process? And he's like, sure, what, what is it? How did the separation happen in the first place? If everything's perfect and everything's love, how could such a thing happen? you mind if we just ask this one question before we keep on with your book? And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, okay, it's a good question. He said, but you can tell by the way that you feel and your emotional roller coaster ride <laughs> as a human being, <laughs> all these emotions up and down and around and around, that you believe that it did. You believe that it did. So it didn't happen, but you believe that it did. So now I'm, there's a book that's going to help you <laughs> and a Holy Spirit that's going to help you because you've circumscribed your sleeping mind with this crazy, tiny, mad idea and it's not even possible. But I'm going to help you see that it's not possible. Then I started to think about hypotheticals and I thought, wow, that must mean this book is, this course is hypothetical. Well, that must be my whole life as David is hypothetical. It must mean the whole planet is hypothetical. It must mean the whole cosmos is hypothetical because the cosmos is as if the separation happened. That really got me thinking. I'm like, so you tell me I'm living in a hypothetical world. And Jesus said, that's right. You believe it. And you act and react to it like it's real. That's your problem. It doesn't exist, but you believe it. So now we have to address that belief. And I've got to show you that that belief in this world is not real and the ego that made that. So you see this idea of hypothetical suddenly went from, you know, a hypothetical orange or something to, oh my gosh, 
human beings are like seven billion contradictions walking around as if they're walking apart. But they don't, they aren't really. You know, there's, there's, we're all really the same Christ. We're all really in the mind of God. So, to me, I did ask Jesus after that, I said, can you explain this? Because I, this is deep stuff. You know, I never thought of my life as a hypothetical or a potentiality or as Deepak Chopra would say, pure potentiality. <laughs> I never thought of my life experience as pure potentiality. You know, I, I thought there was something actually there and that was the problem. Jesus is saying, yeah, you have to you have to forgive your brother, your sister, you've got to forgive David for what he never did because you're dealing in a realm of potentialities and hypotheticals that don't exist. Now hypotheticals imply something that's different than the actual and Jesus was saying spirit is actual, oneness is actual, God is actual, and you're dealing in the realm of potentials. And whatever you believe it's like Pygmalion. It's like, uh, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is whatever you believe you will perceive. So you have to change what you believe in order to escape. And I'll help you do it. And I said, thank you. <laughs> I really need this. Now, the, the whole issue of hypotheticals is all based on time too. Hypotheticals are all based on linear time because what if time wasn't linear. What if time was simultaneous? I did a talk one time, I, I grabbed, I was in Sweden and I, I said, you got any spaghetti? And they said, yeah, what do you need? I said, give me a strand of spaghetti. And they brought out one of these long spaghetti noodles and I did the whole teaching with this noodle in my hand. I said, now look at this noodle, what do you see? A line. And I said, what if we turn it and we look at it from a completely different angle. What do you see? And they said, a point. I said, ha! Ah, this noodle is teaching us a lot. The problem is, we got to get off the noodle. This noodle of linear time is driving us nuts. We are believing in the noodle and it's, we're going crazy. We're, it's madness, it's insanity, this noodle. And I said to Jesus, I was like, well, how did this, how do you get this noodle? And he said, well, he said, in heaven, God is the creator and Christ is the effect. And then he said, here's an important lesson for you. Cause and effect are together. Cause and effect. God and Christ are, guess what? The Father and I are, you know, and he's teaching me now, he's starting to teach me the Course through cause and effect. And he said, now you see that? God and Christ are together. That means, he said, I taught this 2,000 years ago, I and the Father are one. It's the same, we're the same spirit because the cause, the Creator, God, and the effect, Christ, are together. And I said, okay, what's that have to do with the noodle? He said, we'll get to that. So, he said, the ego is the belief that cause and effect are apart. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you believe you left heaven. You're the Christ, and you believe you took off. Somehow you left heaven, you separated from God, and now you're off in some kind of realm of time and space and you separated from God. And Jesus said, remember, cause and effect are together. So, all these hypotheticals that you're dealing with is because you believe that cause and effect are apart. And I said, okay, yeah, that's true. That's, I said, isn't that what science is based on? Even physics, for every action, there's a reaction. If you boil this thing, then, then boil the water at a certain temperature, it turns into steam. If, uh, if somebody comes and hits you with a baseball bat, 
in the knee, and you go, yipes, and your knee swells, cause bat hitting a knee affect sore, swollen knee. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, those are good examples. Those are all Newtonian examples of false cause and effect. Even physics, for every action there's a reaction. He's basically saying, that's the trick. The ego says cause and effect are separate, and Jesus says, the ego says the cause comes first and the effect comes second. I say, yeah, that's, that's what I believe. He said, yeah, you believe in the ego. So I'm telling you, it's not going to work. So I said, well, all of science, every, everything I've studied in 10 years of university, it's all really based on cause comes first, effect comes second. He said, yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. Time is simultaneous. Time is a point and not a line. That's why you have to come to the present moment because as long as you keep perceiving these hypotheticals, coulda, woulda, shouldas, and oh, maybe in the future I'll be happy, and maybe I'll have a partner, maybe I'll graduate, maybe I'll have a child, you know, maybe, 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 maybe. It's like Jesus is like, no, no, it's all hypothetical because cause and effect are together. And then I said, I said, well, if cause and effect are together, that must mean that the means and the end are, are the same. He said, that's ex exactly right. You think the means come first and the end comes somewhere off in time. And he said, no, no. Actually, the means and the ends are together because cause and effect are together. Ooh, that's powerful. That means if I could just forgive that would bring an end to all the hypotheticals. Oh yeah, that would bring an end to all the suffering. Yes, that's it. If I saw that cause and effect were together, then that would be the solution to everything. I would just have that one realization and I would never have another problem. And Jesus said, yeah, that's quite right. But I said, this is kind of deep. Can you give me some examples? This is really deep stuff. Can you give me an example? And, and he said, well, yeah. There was a psychologist that you really liked, David, when you were in university. And I said, who? He said, Abraham Maslow. I said, oh, yeah, I remember. The guy with the pyramid. The hierarchy of needs. And Jesus said, that's right. And what's at the top of the pyramid? Self-actualization. And instead of studying the sick people and postulating that everybody was, was ill, uh, Freud basically, it was a pretty dark philosophy Sigmund Freud had. It was pretty dark. But uh, with ego and id and all these urges and conflicts and everything, Maslow studied the healthiest people. You know, that's kind of interesting that this psychologist would just decide to study the happiest people he could find and base his whole psychology on the happy people? I thought, yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. I don't know why psychology wouldn't think of this. You know, it's like it's, why would you study the sick ones? <laughs> that's really crazy. So Jesus is like, yeah, he was onto it. He studied the happiest, most healthy, joyful, vibrant wise people. He studied them. He didn't even care if they were dead or alive. He, he went back to do his historical research to get the historically happiest people he could find. He had a, wanted a good sample. And, and then he made his whole philosophy based on that. And it said that everyone is good inside. Everyone just reaches their, their actual self eventually. That's what self-actualization is about. You finally transcend all the other stuff, the basic needs and all your things, and you go up and you finally... I said, that's what the Greeks said, know thyself. He said, Jesus said, exactly. <laughs> Self-actualization. It's not a new idea. Know thyself. Okay, so what's this got to do with hypotheticals? Well, he said, that's what Maslow found when he studied the happiest people he could find 
is they seem to have these amazing, amazing moments where they transcended time. Where for the self-actualizing people, they discovered that the means and the end were the same. I said, that's fascinating. Maslow found that out? Yes. He studied all these happy people. And I said, well, can you give me an example? What, is, what, what do you mean? What about these experiences? What are, what's going on up there with these self-actualizing people? He said, he said it would be like somebody who's an artist and who loves to paint and is joyfully painting, 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 and then suddenly one day when they're painting, they have this experience of such glee and such joy because they aren't thinking about the painting for something in the future. They're not thinking about, when will I finish the painting? They're not thinking about, will this be a beautiful painting? Can I sell it and make a lot of money from this painting in the future? They get so into the joy of the moment that the means, the artistry, the activity of the painting in that moment is everything. They don't care about the future when they get that happy. These people got so happy that they ceased to be concerned, they ceased to think about the future. And what they told Maslow is they said the means and the end are the same. It's kind of like the, the Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I don't know if you ever saw that movie or read Dan Millman's book, but when they, he takes the walk with Socrates up into the mountains, and basically he's saying, why did you bring me up here? And he said, it's, the joy is in the journey. The joy isn't a destination. He kept wondering where Socrates was going to take him. He was kind of upset when he got... Socrates said, we're here. And he said, what is this, just a rock? You brought me all the way up the mountain to see a rock? And Socrates said, no, the joy is in the journey. You know, it's, it's the means and end are together. And don't you, we all intuitively know that. If we could just let ourselves be content right now, we're all together. We're at a wonderful place. We're just together. We're going to have a wonderful adventure of the mind tonight. We're going to see a spectacular movie and it's just the joy of the moment where we've ceased to be concerned about the future. You know when children are playing, you know, they go out to play in the summer and they get so into the joy of playing that it's even a shock when mom says, come on in, it's dinner time. Because that come on in is like if you're playing with the crawdads and you're in the stream, you know, and you're just totally there in the moment, even the thought of lunch is not there when you're playing. It's the same thing. Children have a pretty good sense of this. They, they're really there in the moment. And then they, society, parents, everybody says, no, you've got to learn how to take, learn how to keep time, be on time. Don't be late. And then we get more worried, more stressed out, and we end up in a, a mental institution because we've adapted and adjusted to what? To time. And we feel guilty if we're not on, on time. What if we're always on time? What if, we're, if this moment is all that there is and we're, we can gleefully be happy in this moment with no concern whatsoever for, for time? And I bet there's a lot of you in this room who have had some wonderful experiences and you got so happy that you actually lost track of the passage of time. Most everyone has had those experiences. You have lost track of it. That's a miracle. That is an actual miracle when you lose track of time. So I'm going to show this movie because this movie will help us see about hypotheticals. It's hard to teach about hypotheticals because it's so deep, but this movie will help us. So let's roll it and get ready. Hold on to your hats tonight. Hold on to your chairs because Holland is going bye-bye.
Okay. There she is. <laughs> now, you can just imagine you have this ability to see two minutes in the future and you're, you have this feeling you're supposed to meet somebody and it, it's important, but you don't even know what it's about. Well, we're Course in Miracles students, we know what it's about. And we just listened to uh, Elton John last night and we listened to the Beatles the night before. And what did, the, if you think back to the Beatles, what did they teach us? What, what really did we learn from the Beatles? All you need is love, da 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 da. You know, we know why people are supposed to meet. We know why we come together in a relationship. It's about love. It's about love. In fact, if there had to be one clue about how we're going to get out of this hypothetical world, we all know intuitively already what the answer is. It's the love. It's going to be the love. In, in course terms, forgiveness. It's the Holy Spirit. And so, he can see these scenarios, like he just saw with uh, Kali, uh, the FBI agent, and he can see these two-minute scenarios, and so he's getting glimpses of the future. But remember at the beginning of the movie, he said, funny thing about, about time is that every time you look at the future, it changes, and that changes everything. So it seems like this whole thing, remember I was talking about heaven is changeless, heaven is eternity, and we're dealing with a, an optical illusion of change in front of our perception all the time. It's because of the way we're looking, it's the lens we're looking through that is the problem. It's the ego, it's the darkened glass that's, that's making us stressful, and many of us have have memories of the past, even during voice liberation, during some of these dyads and exercises, sometimes you have these memories and these dark, dark feelings and things that surface. We have these memories from the past, but we also have, have ambitions and visions and hopes and scenarios for the future. And basically all of these past memories and all these future, we'll call them like goals or visions, um, they're all generated by the ego to keep us from knowing who we are, to keep us from eternity. And so, just like in this movie, it's the same in our life experiences, that whenever we meet anyone, we never meet anyone by accident. There is no such thing as a random meeting. Every single encounter that we have, everyone we even think of in our minds is an opportunity to forgive. We never really meet anyone, we always meet our idea of them, our past idea. We have image in our mind of who they are. So before they even speak to us, we have formed a mental picture of who they are. And they're just acting out our thoughts and beliefs. They aren't really whole persons because they don't have, we think that people have minds of their own and thoughts of their own, but they're actually projections from the ego. And basically Jesus tells us in the Course that, that these people that seem to be uh, in, in your world, all the people, including the person you think you are, are all, are all some version of the past that you haven't forgiven yet. So. Every time you keep meeting people, you're just meeting the past. And the Holy Spirit's in there going, are you ready to let this go? <laughs> are you ready to see them the way I see them? How beautiful they really are, how lovely, how pure they really are. Or are you going to continue to meet the past and think you're meeting people again for the first time, but actually it's just a mind trip that you're in. You're just stuck in the past. Like Groundhog Day, you're just looping around and around. 
even in terms of reincarnation, you just keep doing this over and over and over, always attracted to the past, always attracted to guilt, and always rehashing, replaying this guilt over and over. But, the Holy Spirit has a plan, and in this case, the Holy Spirit has a major plan here because our main characters are meant to meet and they're meant to start to slowly drop the mask. They're start to start to trust each other, to start to communicate with each other. Isn't that what we hope for in all of our relationships? Someone we can learn to trust, someone we can relax with, someone we can open our heart with, someone we can feel connected with, you know, that's what we want ultimately, but but what Jesus and the Holy Spirit are saying is, yeah, you can have that connectedness, but you're going to have to let go of the past. Because as long as you keep projecting the past, you are, are stuck in a loop, a loop of time. And the future is the same thing. It really uh, is very distracting if you're always thinking about the future. You can't really be fully present if you're always concerned about future outcomes, who, what, where, when, achievement, accomplishment, you know, all the things we were trained, you know, to be successful, always be looking forward, always be trying to make your life better. Well, if God created us perfect, why do we have to be better? You know, maybe we've been racing like a hamster, chasing a bunch of ego goals, and we've been perfect as the Christ right here and right now, always, but we never knew it because we were so caught up into past memories and future goals. So he's got this great ability and now this is the beginning of a holy encounter that will expand his psychic abilities in a way that he doesn't even know about or he doesn't even believe is possible. And she's just come through a very difficult relationship too with this, uh, with this guy. We're going to meet him soon. <laughs> He's kind of a, a, a bit of a stalker uh, that she's been involved with. So the, both of them are being brought together in a, in a forgiveness exercise, in a collaboration where they have to learn to trust each other and to collaborate. And that miraculous collaboration will be a big step to get them beyond the, the, the stuckness, the, the isolation that they feel. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> now this moment is the key for you to wake up. <laughs> I don't want to put any pressure on everyone, but all you have to do is remember this moment, right here, this scene, this moment. And it will be very helpful for you as we move on in, later in this movie. Just this one moment. Just remember it. <laughs> I'm just saying you're going to be really happy when you, when you see what I'm showing you. But that's where the commentary comes in. I'm just pointing out. This is the moment. Okay. Now also I maybe should mention what happens in relationships. They come together. Obviously mentally he's done a lot to help himself <laughs> get into this relationship. But why does anybody get into a relationship at all except to fall in love? They actually want to have a sense of such deep love, connection, where they just become so euphoric and they get reminded of, of what's real and what's true. That's what all love stories are about, to fall into that state of mind, that, that euphoric love and connection. And of course, as soon as we begin to join in purpose and we start to open our hearts up and everything, then the ego starts to mobilize its forces Doubt, fear, mistrust, uh, guilt, anything that it can, because it doesn't want us to get close to the escape hatch. 
And the escape hatch is love. You know, it truly is coming into that moment where we just are so connected. We feel so much love pouring through us, shining through us, as us, that, that we suddenly start to remember who we really are. And relationships present so many opportunities for forgiveness. And I would say, in the case with Chris and Liz here, they are going to be tested pretty soon by the ego. Uh, because they're just starting to open up into this deep love and this deep connection. And you can see it, you can feel it right there. She's even saying, you know, maybe there is such a thing as destiny, which he was talking about, seeing the future and destiny. And she's starting to open up to the whole idea. But then the ego is going to test, test, test. So I'll, I'll pause it again once we get to this real pivotal decision points. Because we all know those points in relationships, you know, when, when the fear comes up, when the doubt comes up, we have to decide whether we're going to trust or not. And when we don't trust, then we seem to recycle into past patterns again. It just comes around at us again and again and again. Whenever we have fear, we just keep drawing witnesses of fear and we know that there has to be a way out. And we do know that it involves trust. Even what we were sharing today when I was bringing up, uh, talking to Francis, bringing up Kirsten, bringing up Emily, talking to Lilo, we were talking about purpose and joining in purpose and being connected in mind and connected in prayer. And it's really the same in all relationships. The more you, you are connected in mind, connected in prayer, that takes you into the, that intimacy that of, is of one mind, to be of one mind. And so we're going to see them get tested here. Okay. <laughs> now you've been hearing me talk about private thoughts and people pleasing. And he was saying to her, something wrong. This is what comes up in relationships when you, when you hold on to thoughts and you, if your goal is healing, you have to disclose things. You, you can't say, no, I'm fine, when you're afraid or terrified, or sad, or whatever. This is, this is the power of disclosure. This is the power of transparency. If you start to fall in love, then that's the first step, and you going deeper in, but you have to develop the trust. And the trust cannot be developed if you have private thoughts that you won't expose. You know, this is your mighty companion that you're going for a very deep purpose. And these are those turning points, really, in relationships where you either have to trust in something greater than yourself and that by exposing, the Spirit will use it to help you go deeper, to help you release the thoughts. But the ego is always telling us, you know, just put on a face, just fine, 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 smile your way through it. You know, it's very much of a pretense because it doesn't want these thoughts to be released and it doesn't even want them exposed. It just wants you to kind of swallow them, so to speak, just stuff them down and stuff them down and stay guilty. That's what the ego's purpose is, is to, for, for the mind to say, stuck in the guilt. So he knew that there was something important about this relationship and there always is in the sense that when we are allowed relationships to be used by the Holy Spirit and by Jesus they're going to be a journey down into authenticity and a journey into transparency and exposing and releasing. So this is just a perfect moment because you know she's got to the point where now she you know they they told her all this about him. It seems to contradict her feelings that she was having and but she has these fears and doubts now about trust. I mean this is clearly a moment of trust in the relationship, in the very new relationship. This is one of those key trust points. 
And as you go deeper into spirituality, you, you start to recognize these moments where you can either just act out of the fear or you can just trust and expose what's on your mind, trusting that the somehow if you're supposed to fall deeper into love and, and come to the truth of things, that you'll be guided there. So this is, this is really a good little display of what we're talking about, a lot of the techniques of release. But they don't know that. You see, he's, ever since he's been a child, he had this gift, but he's been tested and tested and tested, and for him he feels more like like a bit of a lab rat with it, like he told her, you know, in that one scenario, people like you have been trying to help me but have been torturing me. So he has this gift, but he has a great resistance to collaborating and, and using that. And she's saying, you know, but with me you can see further. So she's seeing there may be a potential for helping in a greater way. And he says, but they, they don't know that. So he's dealing with his own fears, his own past, his own belief that his gift has been misused. And he's got some fear and guilt around that. So he's, he's a bit protective around his gift because of what he perceives as the difficulties that it has brought to him in his life. And she's, again, part of some kind of collaboration that he just said, I don't know why, but with you I can see further and I had, I had to see why. He doesn't even know why. But they both have this openness, that's how they're being used by the Spirit, because there's some greater plan, and it's the same for all of us, there's a much greater plan of, of learning to forgive and learning to let go of these hypotheticals and learning to to collaborate and be truly helpful. That's the prayer at the beginning of the course. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me, and I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. So this journey is about allowing the Holy Spirit to use relationships to open your heart up, to learn to trust, to expose private thoughts, and to start to realize that there are no private thoughts, there are no secrets that you would need to keep. For most human beings, they think, well, there's some thoughts that I, I really have to hide. Because if I, if I don't hide these thoughts, then I'm going to be rejected, abandoned, things are not going to go well. So I have to, the ego says you have to hide certain thoughts and you have to keep certain secrets. And then comes along the witness of Jesus 2,000 years ago where his heart became so pure, his mind became so clear, he realized that there was never a good reason for a secret, because a secret is what? It's something that you hide. And Jesus just realized by tuning in to God and the Holy Spirit that whatever he would think and say and do would be for the good of everyone, for the good of the whole universe. And there's nothing to hide in that. And that's why we keep exposing these private thoughts. That's why we we release them to the Holy Spirit. We're going through a purification process so that we can actually say and mean this beautiful workbook lesson that actually is repeated over and over in the workbook. My mind holds only what I think with God. As long as we believe the private thoughts and the secrets are real, we feel guilt. But as we learn to expose and release those secrets, those private thoughts, those attack thoughts, those grievances, then we feel innocent, we feel holy. I'm, you know, my holiness encompasses everything I see. There's nothing my holiness cannot do. There's workbook lessons in there about how, 
how holy we truly are, but as long as we hold on to these secrets and private thoughts and we are not willing to expose them, then we really are limiting ourselves to, to holding on to the past and we keep generating these characters and these situations all based on past thoughts and they, it's just a loop of guilt that just goes on and on and on until you finally forgive and break the cycle and, and realize I would have no thoughts, Holy Spirit, that I would keep to myself. Take these thoughts from me. I'm not guilty. I'm not going to hide. These judgmental thoughts that I feel, they are not my real thoughts. I would not protect them anymore. I'm not going to hide them from you. I'm going to let them go to you to be released. So this is now a, a relationship where they both, he's exposed his gift and she's exposed her, her doubt thoughts and fear thoughts. Uh, you know, she's come right out and said, oh my God, you are delusional. <laughs> you know, she's, she's wearing her heart out and just leaves. She's just letting those thoughts come up, like this is what's going on in her mind. But there is some kind of spark and there is some kind of, of love there that is just, just beginning with these two. <laughs> Cooperation. <laughs> you may think they're your enemy, but in the end the Holy Spirit is like, let's try some cooperation here. Because it's all about helpfulness, you know, opening up, letting go, going past our fears, going past our doubts. It's all about joining, connecting, collaborating. And we just get so many opportunities. So here, they've kind of run out a lot of their fear scenarios, but now Kali's reaching out to him and just saying, you know, let's, let's work together. You're still alive, I'm still alive, we're all still alive, she's still alive. And so she has wanted him all along to help her out to do her job, to use his gift. And now he's kind of reached a point where he's going to start to begin to open up even to make a collaboration here with, with Kali. And that's pretty much the way it goes as we go through this awakening process. The more you just pray to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and say, use me for the plan, then there's going to be a series of, of relationships and collaborations that will come in and more than we're even aware of or aware that are, is even possible. But we... Once we decide to be truly helpful, once we just say yes to Jesus and say, all right, I don't know how this is going to go, but I want to be helpful. I would rather be helpful than hide. I would rather be helpful in the greater plan than just be shy, than be recoiled, to, than be reserved. I would rather trust and follow your guidance and your instructions that I could be helpful because ultimately you're telling me this is for my own mind. This is how my mind will be released of the fear and guilt by being truly helpful. I think all of us have known that intuitively. That has to be the way to reach God. It's through helpfulness. We just don't know how. You know, we have our own small limited definitions of being helpful and the prayer is I am here to be truly helpful which to release the ego and the judgments and the attack thoughts, that has to be the most helpful thing we can do, is free our mind, is purify our heart. So in this scenario, it's come all the way to this point where he's now going to allow his gift to be used and she's going to collaborate with him. And he has an incentive because he's seen He's seen Liz blow up two hours in the future and he's able to go far beyond two minutes to those two hours. And so he has a reason. He, he, he has a reason of wanting to save her, of wanting their relationship to continue. So he has a purpose for his gift now and this is requiring him to collaborate with Callie. And uh, she's 
had her thought too, no good deed goes unpunished, but now she's had to soften away from that kind of harsh stance and she's had to learn to communicate and collaborate too. So you notice what he just said, every way I try this she still ends up dead. He's starting to go fishing in his mind for hypotheticals. We can do that too, you know. It's not just him. We can do that. I had a, one of my students many years ago, she came to visit me in my peace house in Cincinnati and I could tell she was really kind of, she was antsy and she was a bit frustrated and, and watching the internet a lot, kind of bored and everything and she really wasn't into the the flow of things with meditating or working on projects or anything like this and so I finally, I said, what's going on? You know, you can tell me whatever it is. And she said, well, I keep thinking about this guy. I had this boyfriend and, you know, I don't know. I, I just thinking about a guy all day long and I, I want to read the Course, I want to meditate, I just keep thinking about this guy and maybe, you know, Maybe we could have had a relationship and, you know, I don't know, I said, I said where does he live? And, well, I, I think uh, he's in Costa Rica. And I said, so you're thinking about a guy in Costa Rica? She said, yeah, I can't decide whether I want to have a relationship with him or not. And I'm just, it's hard. It's really hard. I just keep thinking about him all day. I, it was like Friday. I said, well, just go in your room and go into your mind and in your mind catch a plane and fly down in your mind to Costa Rica and spend the week, spend the weekend with him. Just go indulge, have fun in your mind. Uh, just really have, just give yourself over to this guy uh, down in Costa Rica for the weekend. So, then came uh, Monday morning and I just saw her and I said, uh, so how to work out? And she said, it didn't work out. <laughs> but you, she had spent the whole weekend in the hypotheticals, weighing <laughs> everything and fantasizing, imagine everything and playing it out. You know, we do this, we play things out. In our mind, when we're offered a job or we have an opportunity, we play it out, we play it out. And he's just said, every way I, I look at it, it's not good. She still ends up dead. So this is the beginning of starting to realize that this is how you're going to reach forgiveness. Is you have to go into your mind and you have to come to a place through guidance. It's almost like a giant sort of your mind where you, you basically are going to give up all the hypotheticals that are in your mind. In fact, Jesus said, it has never really occurred to you to give up all your fearful thoughts. It sounds very much like the Buddha. Remember Buddha, empty your mind? You know, it has never really occurred for you because all of these hypothetical thoughts are all coulda, woulda, shoulda thoughts, you know. They, they're all thoughts about this world. That's the thoughts that make this world. They're all hypotheticals. Could this happen? Could that happen? And even though he seems to be able to read two minutes into the future, or with Liz, two hours even into the future, it's still, he's still reading the past. You know, sometimes people say to me, what about these uh, what about Nostradamus? You know, he seemed to be able to be aware of events that would occur centuries before they they even happened. And and I said, what's so extraordinary about that? They said, well, that's some prophecy. You know, to be able to see war and and missiles and things that weren't even invented, and he sees all this in his mind centuries in advance and you're saying, what's the big deal? I'm saying, well, 
he's just able to to read the script. He's just he's just reading the future past. What? Never heard of such a thing. The future past. Of course, he's just reading the future past. He's just reading the script of the future. It's past. Again, this doesn't make any sense to the ego, but Jesus is telling us in the Course, you are mentally reviewing what has already gone by. That's what he tells us in the Course. And then he comes out and he says, this world was over long ago. Oh my gosh. Now, is that what you're telling me now, Jesus? That everything that's going to happen in the future has already happened? Yes, that's it. So you mean all these ambitions I had have already happened? Yes, they've already happened. You mean everything I've, I've fantasized about, I had fictional ideas, my hopes, my future dreams and everything, they're already done? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You're off the hook. You've got no need to stress or worry anymore. It's already done. And he said, that's what I'm trying to do with my workbook, is I'm trying to train your mind to realize that this world was over long ago. Think about how that would take away your worries. You wouldn't be concerned about the future at all if you knew it already had happened. You wouldn't be, have any anxiety about the future. No concerns. Talk about a kuna matata. No cares, no worries for the rest of your life. Hakuna Matata. You know, I tried to reach you through the Lion King. I'm telling you, it's over. It's Hakuna Matata time. It's time to relax and enjoy. You've got no pressures. And I'll just guide you. I'll guide you. I'll tell you exactly what to say, what to do, where to go. But you don't even have to think about the future. That's a weight off your back. Well, what? I said, what's about, you're, you've, you're teaching me that it's already over? He said, yeah, haven't you been paying attention to the workbook lessons? That's lesson number seven. I see only the past. Oh my God. <laughs> and then, if you still don't believe it, you can go to workbook lesson number eight. What's that? My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. I'm telling you, Jesus said, your thoughts make your world. Your thoughts are past, and the world you see is the past. And that's why I see only the past, is because my mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. You've got a time problem going on here. You've got no relationship problems, no financial problems, no health issues, no issues with the environment, no issues about politics or anything, you simply have a time issue going on and you believe that you actually live in what is already over. That's your issue. So in terms of here, our main character here, Chris, is he now is being drawn into helpfulness. He now has a reason to collaborate with the FBI agent, Kali, because he has a, a love for Liz and he doesn't want her to die. And she didn't want him to die. That's why she spilled the beans, you know, and said, I drugged you. Because she said, they're going to shoot you if you run and I don't want you to die. She said it twice. I don't want you to die. And he doesn't want her to die. So through the desire to be helpful, through that love that's in there, the Spirit's going to take us higher and higher to let go of these past thoughts that we believe are present, but they really aren't. The present moment is not between the past and the future. The present moment is before time was. Before Abraham was, I am. We, we cannot think that we're going to find it. We're not going to find the present inside of linear time. It actually is, is prior. We have to go way back, way back with the Holy Spirit in our mind, prior to the belief in time. So now you're going to start to see some really interesting things because 
once Kali and, and Chris start to collaborate, they're a pretty good team. They're a pretty good team. They're pretty sharp together. Because he can see the future and she's a pretty sharp shooter. <laughs> so, you know, as far as going on a mission together to, to save the day for Liz and for Los Angeles, now they've got a common goal. It took them a while. You know, they were at each other. Cat and mouse, they're pretty strong for quite a while. It took them a while, but now they do, they have joined here. Okay, now here's a key. You know, earlier today I was talking about the difference between working for a corporation and working for God. <laughs> it's pretty different. <laughs> one's based on guidance, one's based on fear of survival. And following a bunch of meaningless rules <laughs> in the world in order to seemingly make the body survive. Versus listen, follow your mind waking up to its true identity. Really big contrast. Now here they come together and she's there and she's got her team, her SWAT team's there, FBI, look at the headgear. You see they've got the high-tech equipment, they've got the high-tech uh, uniforms, it's just like, it's like a, a bomb squad, SWAT team. This is the military intelligence. On the one hand, we have the military intelligence. It's the FBI and all their gadgets. They've got all their high-tech gadgets and they're good at defending, attack and defense. They're the best. They're machines at attack and defense. And then you've got, the, you've got Chris. And Chris is in love and he's tuned in intuitively. He was just tuning in to find that license plate. What's Chris using? The power of his mind. Does Chris have a gun? No. Does Chris have fancy equipment? Like the military intelligence? No. He's just got a simple jacket on. He's using the power of his mind. Now we get to see the military intelligence side by side with intuition. You judge for yourself. <laughs> which is most helpful in these next scenes. He'll take this route to the entrance gate. At that point, Alpha and Bravo will swarm the entrance. If you could just be quiet and do exactly what I say, I'll save your life. Okay. <laughs> okay. Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit has a word for military intelligence. If you can just be quiet, and do exactly as I say, I'll save your life. There they are, side by side. Bravo, we'll come in here and we'll bring in the crew here and we'll get those bad guys with all our guns and bombs. If you can just be quiet and do exactly as I say, I'll save your life. That's the Holy Spirit in your mind. As you got all these plans for the future, you're all worried, you're concerned, you're feeling guilty, you deal with a hundred different problems every day, you solve most of them, you got a hundred more the next day, and the next day, and on and on and on. That's the human condition. Problems, problems, more problems, more problems, more problems. You get sick and you die. You know, this, I just want to make it boil it down <laughs> for you, the human condition. Problems, 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 get sick, die. Okay. Now, there is an, op an alternative to that which is called, I can guide you and if you listen <laughs> and you're very still <laughs> and listen and do what I say, I can save your life. I can return your mind to the kingdom of heaven. That's why we're here. This is into the, into the kingdom retreat. So you see, when I'm talking about intelligence, I'm not talking about the intelligence of the world. I'm talking about the spirits, intuitive intelligence that everybody has. And all we have to do is tap into it. All we have to do is listen and follow. If you listen and don't follow, then I'm not going to guarantee anything. You become a, a Course in Miracles scholar who's unhappy.
Uh, but if you listen and follow, ah, wow, wow. So let's see what happens here. We still get to see the military intelligence trying to go one step ahead and then the Holy Spirit's like, please. You take this one, I'll do the rest. The whole team, you take this deck, I'll do the rest. He's going to do the rest, how? With his mind. Superposition. I told you I'd get the quantum physics in here. He will look in his mind, just like he can see into the future, when you start to realize that everything is in your mind, that nothing is outside of you, you can start to look at the hypotheticals, the alternatives, and you're really starting to sort through things in your mind, because that's where the problem has always been. Not in the body, not in the world, but in the mind. So here he's trying to rescue Liz, and he says, you take this deck, I'll take all the rest. So this is a beautiful scene in the movie because this, this is not only superposition, which is potentialities of all these different places in this warehouse where he can look for Liz, uh, but more than that, he realizes all these potential places in the warehouse are all in his mind. So he can do the search in his mind. Like I had my student, you know, spend the weekend with a guy in Costa Rica. See how it goes. Oh, it didn't work out. Okay, you know, we can do this, you know, we can, we can work through this in our mind, especially with the Holy Spirit's help. So this is superposition in action. This is how the Holy Spirit uses superposition. One more step, fortune teller, and it definitely won't be good for you. Okay, this is going to be a very graphic scene of hypotheticals. He's just going to look at all the hypotheticals as he charges the guy to get the girl. And you get to see them all, but uh, he also sees them all. So he's not held off by it. He's going to go and save her. That's right, for half the movie you've been watching a hypothetical. <laughs> Did it get you? <laughs> Do you have any emotions come up during that <laughs> hypothetical scene? <laughs> now that's a hypothetical. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. But the beautiful thing is, like I was sharing earlier, once you start to realize that this whole world is hypothetical, you know, it, it's as if the separation happened, you can actually start to relax. I mean, really. I mean, it seems mind-bending and mind-blowing. I told you I'd blow your mind tonight. I said we were going to go deeper. So we eased in with Elton John and, <laughs> and the Beatles. <laughs> with the music, just to kind of soften you up a little bit. <laughs> and then, here we go. <laughs> yeah, this is the stuff. But see, the, if the whole world is hypothetical, then you can start to relax, because then, you know, what really matters is you tuning into your guidance, to what brings you joy. It's what Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. You don't have to worry about the consequences of the world because really these are hypothetical. Cause and effect are together. You're the Christ, for Christ's sake. <laughs> You're the Christ, so you can't mess it up, you see? You can't really die. You can just seem to generate a hypothetical with sickness and death, but you can't really die. And in the end, you know, if you think, oh my God, what's going to happen after I die? Jesus is like, I'm trying to tell you. You can't. Because of who created you. The ego's tried to pull this, the wool over your eye and make you scared of all kinds of things, but it's, it's not what it seems. Nothing is what it seems. And actually, there is a part in the Course where um, Jesus says, 
all of the roadways of the world lead to death. And he's basically saying all these hypotheticals that the ego has invented, no matter how you try to work them out, we just saw a whole scenario play out, but it's, it doesn't matter how you p try to play it out. In the end you have to accept the atonement, you have to forgive to accept your, your perfection, to accept your holiness, to accept your love, to accept your innocence, to accept your spiritual reality, you do have to forgive the illusion. And, and that's really an amazing function when you think of it. It starts to put everything into perspective. Suddenly you start to say, wow, I don't have to be so worried about the future. I can give my time to met myself time to meditate. Give myself time to really do those course lessons, you know, really sink into them because they're taking me toward the truth and away from dreams and away from the darkness and back in inward into the light. And all of a sudden you, you start to feel grateful for the Course, like, oh my gosh, this is so, so wise, this is so deep and so profound, but it's, it's doable. The, God's plan for salvation cannot fail. God would not give me a plan of awakening without giving me the means to awaken. And in the end I start to see time collapses through miracles and that the Alpha and the Omega come closer and closer together and in the end it all comes back to the point. It all comes back to the point which is the holy instant and that's the awakening. So here he is, now he's come all the way through that scenario and he's back in bed with her and he's got another chance. <laughs> another chance for what? to collaborate. Maybe he could join a little bit swifter with Kali <laughs> than he did the last time. Because <laughs> he said, I made a mistake. His, the only mistake we can ever make is not joining, is not connecting, is not collaborating. So, we'll see how he goes here. Okay, even the credits. <laughs> it's fast. Once you <laughs> Well, she, it's backwards and it's fast. That's a very good teaching at the very end too. Uh, because everything in this world is upside down. And everything in this world is out of proportion. It's kind of like Alice in Wonderland when she goes down the rabbit hole. But because everything's backwards and upside down, that's why it's so important to be intuitive. That's why it's really important that you, that you tune in to Jesus and the Holy Spirit's guidance because to the extent you can do that, it will go much faster and it will be much smoother. Just like he was kind of collaborating and using his skill, that's the way it goes. The more you get in touch with the guidance, the more that the Holy Spirit uses your skills, abilities, uses everything that's available in mind to, to wake you up in the most rapid way possible because the Holy Spirit would not have a delay, would not delay your joy, would not delay your happiness. So I know for myself the most important thing when I got in touch of the, with the Course was trying to use the Course in the most devoted way to get in touch with my internal teacher, which was Jesus. And in that sense, you know, that's that's what the Course is for. It's just a vehicle, it's just a tool that the Spirit can use to help you get in touch with the, your internal teacher, with, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And once you make contact, like really make contact, you don't have to worry so much about reading the book because it's like Jesus is in there, it's like, I will guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. And if you listen and you're still your mind, I'm going to save your life. <laughs> so thank you. We won't have anything else tonight. I want you to go have a sweet dream tonight. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you.